Hi, everyone, and welcome to online lectures 25 and 26. We're going to cover all of correlation today. Um, so let's kind of jump in here and talk about this test. I find that this test is probably the most familiar to students. Um, so I, I think that it's uh, one of the more like tests that we cover. Okay, so, so far, we have had one qualitative or nominal variable and one quantitative variable for all of our tests. That's the Z test, all of the T tests, and the ANOVAs, right? Um, so we had one qualitative nominal variable that was our independent variable and one quantitative or continuous variable that was our dependent variable. And I guess you might argue that, okay, with factorial ANOVA um, that we had, we had two qualitative nominal variables, but for the most part, that's what we've been dealing with, okay? Now, we're gonna ask the question today, what if you have two quantitative, two continuous variables, and you want to know how associated or related they are. That would be a job for correlation. So think about uh, an example that we're gonna carry out a little bit. We're gonna carry it through a little bit today. Hours of sleep and positive mood. Two continuous variables, right? Maybe we're rating mood from, from one to 100 or even one to 10. Maybe, and we have hours of sleep typically goes from zero to 12, right? Both kind of continuous variables there. And we wanna know if they're related, if they're associated. Okay. So the primary use of correlation is to examine two quantitative, two continuous variables to determine if there's a linear relationship between them. So now I'm introducing this new term of linear. And I'm gonna ask that you hold on to that for just a little bit. And we're gonna come back around and talk about what we mean by linear. Okay, so what's different about the Pearson correlation coefficient? And that's the, there are actually a few different correlation coefficients we could be talking about, but we're just going to talk about the Pearson correlation coefficient. That's the only one we'll cover in this class. So we're going to have two continuous variables. It's going to be used for linear relationships, not differences. And the two variables, and this is key, the two variables are not going to be labeled as independent or dependent. They're just going to be two variables. We're not going to call one independent and one dependent. Nope. We're just having two variables and we're interested in their relationships. Okay. So let's look at the assumptions for the statistic. The individuals, cases, or persons are independent. Okay. Well, that's a common assumption. That's something we've dealt with in the past, right? Our individuals, our, our, our people in our study, our participants, if you will, have to be independent from each other. Now, the populations from which the sample is selected must be normally distributed for both variables. Now, we're used to saying that it must be normally distributed for the dependent variable, but remember, this time we have two continuous variables. So we want both of those to be normal. And three, the variables must be linearly related. There we go again with that linearly. And if you're starting to guess that this has something to do with a line, you're absolutely right. Okay. So one thing that you've probably heard about correlation, if you've heard anything about correlation, you've probably heard this, that correlation does not equal causation. Correlation does not equal causation. Well, we're going to attack this phrase in a little bit and understand why we say that. 
So let's consider a, a few examples before we do that. First of all, cavities and vocabulary. Well, those two are highly correlated. As vocabulary goes up, so does cavities. So should we stunt our children's learning of new words to um, a system and not getting as many cavities? Will that work? And of course you're saying no, um, that wouldn't work. It's just that they're both related to age. As age goes up, so does vocabulary. As age goes up, so do cavities. Okay, so another thing that's related are ice cream consumption and shark attacks. Hmm, those two seem to go together. So should we all cut back on our Ben and Jerry's to prevent shark attacks? And the answer again is no. Why? Because they're both related to the warm weather. That's why they happen to co-occur. That's why they happen to be correlated because they both tend to occur more during the summer months when people are eating ice cream more and when people are in the water and more shark attacks happen. Okay. Here's a few more silly examples for you. Is Facebook driving the Greek debt crisis? We see that those two things seem to be highly correlated and yet we know that that one is not causing the other. Did AVAs cause the US housing bubble? We have the housing price index, and babies named AVA. Would M. Night Shyamalan start making good movies again if people bought more newspapers? Okay, so if you like M. Night Shyamalan's more recent movies, I apologize. But um, this, we're talking about his score on Rotten Tomatoes and total newspaper sales. And finally, is this mountain range affecting the murder rate? Murders in New York State. And look at that mountain range. Okay. So in all these cases, we know that correlation does not imply causation. So why do we make such a big deal out of it? All right. Because the thing is, any time any time that you do not manipulate the independent variable, you cannot assume causation, right? That's what we talked about way back for exam one, that any time you do not manipulate the independent variable, you cannot assume causation. So why do we make such a big deal out of it for correlation? Well, with correlation, we have no independent variable. We have no predictor with correlation. So you have no idea which variable might have caused the other. So that's why I said that point was important a few slides back because correlation is unique since it can never be used to determine causation, right? If we have all the other pieces in place, we could use a Z-test, a T-test, an ANOVA, et cetera, to look at the question of causation, but we can't with correlation. We can't because neither is defined as the independent variable or the dependent variable. Okay. All right. So let's talk about graphing correlations because that's gonna be a key piece in us understanding correlations. And to graph correlations, we use what's called a scatter plot. We put one variable on the x-axis and one variable on the y-axis and we use one dot per participant. So let's look at this hours of sleep and happy mood example. And this is some fictional data that we were talking about before. And you can see that the each person has two scores. This person slept for five hours and has a happy mood rating of two. This person slept for seven hours, has a happy mood rating of four, eight hours and seven, six hours and two, six hours and three, 10 hours and six. That's our data. So how do we go about actually creating a scatter plot for this data? Well, we start off by labeling our axes. Hours slept last night, happy mood. Now here's the question. Could we have put 
happy mood on the bottom and our slept last night on the side. Yes, we could have, because it doesn't matter because neither one's the IV, neither one's the DV. So that's step one. We put our two variables in here. Step two is we're going to go ahead and um, put our numbers in, okay? So our ranges, our slept last night, we're gonna go with zero to 12. And for happy mood, we're gonna go with zero to eight. And we would do this after looking at our data and seeing that no one falls outside of those ranges. Okay, now we move on to step three. And we want to start plotting our data. So as I mentioned, the first person slept for five hours and had a happy mood of two. So we go across five, up two, and we place a dot there. Then we're going to do the same for the person who slept six hours and reported a happy mood rating of two. Six hours, happy mood rating of three. Seven hours, happy mood rating of four. And so on and so forth with the last two. Here's another example. We have our X values, our Y values. Again, it doesn't matter which one we put where. And we go ahead and we have this data, six data points, six people, excuse me. And for person A, they're one and one. Person B is one and three, one and three. Person C is three and two, three over, two up. Person D is four over, five up. Person E is six over, four up. And person F is seven over, five up. Okay. Now let's start talking about that line, that linear relationship. What we're looking for whenever we look at a scatter plot is is, is there a line that kind of goes through the data that's not a horizontal line, that's not a straight horizontal line that, that shows a relationship? So let's look at that. Here we have a perfect positive correlation. Look at that beautiful diagonal line that goes through each of the dots. That's a perfect positive correlation very strong, the strongest you can have. Now this is a strong positive correlation. And I still see a very nice diagonal line that goes through this data. And finally, I have a weak positive correlation. Now this might start looking like a bit of a blob to you, but it's still not. There is still that nice diagonal line going through this data set. Now, if you're wondering why these are all called positive, it's because as one goes up, as X goes up, Y goes up. And we're going from the lower left to the upper right. Lower left, upper right. Well, you might be wondering, well, what if it went the other way? What if it went from upper left to lower right? That would still be a perfect correlation. It's just that in this case, it's a perfect negative correlation, perfect negative correlation. This is just as good as the perfect positive correlation. It's just as good. Here is our strong negative correlation. Here is our weak negative correlation. In all cases, going from the upper left to the lower right. So now as one goes up, as X goes up, Y comes down. 
as x goes up, y comes down. They're going in opposite directions. The other thing I just want to point out is that this, like I said before, with the with the weak positive correlation, that this almost looks like a blob. We can still make out the line pretty clearly here, though. Um, and this is the kind of correlation psychologists get excited about. This is the kind of correlation you might see reported in our very own literature. OK. So if you are wondering what no correlation looks like, there you go. That's the blob. There's really no good line to put through here. Okay. And finally, this is a nonlinear correlation. It's not that you have one best fit line that goes through it or one line going that way. It's more of a curve, right? You see that? So we're not going to be able to look at the relationship using our calculation of correlations. We're not going to be able to, to look at this relationship, frankly, using any of the tools in our toolbox this semester. So if you get a curvy relationship in a scatter plot like this, like a smiley face, anything like that, that's not a line, you know that there's no appropriate statistic in our toolbox for it. Okay. So let's talk more about this correlation stuff and, and how the numbers work and all of that. Okay. So we already started to talk about positive correlation and negative correlation. With positive correlation, both variables tend to increase or decrease together. With negative correlation, the two variables tend to change in opposite directions. One increases while the other decreases. Now, one is not necessarily better than the other. I know one is called positive and one's called negative. That doesn't matter. They're both equally good. Just telling you what kind of relationship you have. So this is just the direction positive or negative. Now let's look at the strength, how much one variable tells you about the other. So our range is from negative one to positive one. A perfect positive correlation gives you a plus one. That's the strongest. A perfect negative correlation gives you negative one. That's the strongest. And no correlation gives you zero. That's the weakest. So with correlation, the goal is to be close to positive one or negative one. You don't want to be close to zero. Okay. All right. So statisticians measured the direction and strength of a correlation with a statistic called the correlation or Pearson correlation coefficient represented by the letter R. And as I said, we will be using the Pearson correlation coefficient represented by the letter R. And how do we want that R? Very close to positive one or very close to negative one, not very close to zero. Let's go through our example about hours of sleep and happy mood. <coughs> so you have six students who reported the number of hours they slept last night and their mood. You believe that there is an association between hours of sleep and happy mood. Alpha is 0.05. Now, the alternative hypothesis where we always like to start is that, I'm going to show you where it is right in the, in the problem, there is an association between hours of sleep and happy mood. 
Null hypothesis, we add the word not, just like we always have in the past. There is not an association between number of hours of sleep and happy mood. Okay. Now, remember I told you with ANOVA that we weren't going to deal with one-tailed or two-tailed? Well, now we're back to it. Now we're dealing with one-tailed and two-tailed again, okay? So this would be a two-tailed example because I didn't tell you about direction. This would be a two-tailed example because I didn't tell you about direction. You don't know whether to expect a positive correlation or a negative correlation. Now, let's change the game a little bit. You have six students who reported the number of hours they slept last night in their mood. You believe that as the student's number of hours of sleep increases, their happy mood also increases. Alpha is 0.05. So let's look at the alternative hypothesis first. Once again, we can pull that directly from the problem. As the student's number of hours of sleep increases, their happy mood also increases. And this is just a little bit shorter way of saying that. Add the word not to get our null hypothesis. As the number of hours of sleep increases, happy mood does not increase. So here again is our question, is this one-tailed or two-tailed? And we answer it's one-tailed because now we're told that as one increases, the other increases. Okay, so do you remember what kind of um, direction we're looking at here? Is it positive or negative if we're talking about that as one increases, the other increases? Positive, positive. Now, if you want to see what a negative would look like, it would be you believe that as the student's number of hours of sleep increases, their happy mood decreases. That would be a negative direction. So again, if you wanna hear about that negative direction it would be you, um, as the student's number of hours of sleep increases, their happy mood decreases. that would be negative. Okay. So here's our Pearson correlation example again, and here's our data again. We've seen this before, right? Our six people in this study. Here's the, um, here's our look at the actual scatter plot as shown in SPSS. Now, this to me, to my eye, really looks like a very linear relationship, right? It looks linear and it looks positive because I'm going from lower left to upper right. Now, here is how it would look in SPSS, your results. Now, we're not gonna do correlation by hand, we're just going to interpret SPSS results. And the good news is that this is one of the easier results to interpret in SPSS. Okay, so let's look at it. Um, so let's look at this four squares and let's understand what's in them. Hours slept, hours slept. Well, I'm not interested in something correlating with itself. That's just gonna always be a one. Mood, mood. That's always gonna be a one, that, that's not interesting. Okay, let's get rid of these two cells. Let's always get rid of these two cells. The upper left, the lower right, we're not gonna pay any attention to. In fact, I'd like you to focus on this cell. Now I will point out this cell, the upper right, and the lower left are the same. So it doesn't matter which one you look at. I think this one's the easiest one just to remember Always look at the upper right cell and you'll be in good shape. Okay, so now we have our slept, happy mood, correlation, the R is 0.853.
What do you think? Closer to a one or negative one or closer to a zero? I'd say it's very close to a positive one, right? This is a positive number, 0.853, very close to positive one. But here is our sig to tell us so. Now this is our sig for a two-tailed. This is our sig for a two-tailed. And it's 0.031, less than our alpha of 0.05. Yep, less than our alpha of 0.05. So this is significant and we're in good shape. And how many people were there? Six. That tells us how many people there were. Now, let's suppose we were doing that that um, different example, the second one I showed you where we said that as hours of sleep increases, happy mood also increases. Then we would take this p-value, the sig value, and divide by two. And we would get 0 0.0155. Okay, now we have one tailed again, right? Let's say that this, I had said the same thing, but this was a negative value. This was negative 0.853. Let's just pretend for a second. Now what? Now this may be very um, significant, right? If we divide it by 2.0155, very significant um, p-value. However, we would not reject the null because we claimed a positive relationship. And if this was negative, if this was a negative sign, this would be a negative relationship. So that still holds. Let's look at one more example. You have eight participants who were exposed to 10 words a certain number of times and then asked to recall the words. You want to know if persons who received more exposures to the words recalled more words. Okay, so here is our number of exposures. Here is the number of words recalled. Here is some data regarding that. Look at this. This time I see a negative relationship. This time I see a negative relationship. Now keep in mind, this is all fictional data. This is all for your um, example, so you can see different things. But yes, here is that negative relationship. So as X increases, Y is decreasing. As the number of word exposures increases, the number of words recalled decreases. I know that's a little counterintuitive, but again, this is just for example sake. So now we look at our correlation and we see just as it looked like in the picture in the scatter plot, it is negative. It's a negative 0.545. Our sig is 0 0.005, and this time we have 25 people. Remember, I'm just looking in this upper right cell. Okay, well, one thing you might be wondering is how come the last one was 0 0.8, and I'll show you again, 0 0.853, and we only had the sig value of 0 0.031, and this one is lower, right? Lower in absolute value, it's 0.545 or negative 0.545, but yet the sig value is much, much lower. So it seems like a much stronger finding. And the answer is it has to do with the N, right? Remember that, the bigger the N, the more likely you are to find a result. Okay. That's just an aside. The main thing I want you to take away is to look at this negative relationship and know how to interpret the sig value. And recall, we predicted a negative relationship. Since we predicted one, we're in good shape. Had we, right? Oh, excuse me, we did not. We'd be in bad shape. 
You want to know if persons who received more exposures to the words recalled more words. What are we predicting here, negative or positive? Positive. What did we get? Negative. Uh-oh. Even though we would still chop this in half, even though it would be 0. 0. 0. 0.0025, that doesn't matter. We cannot reject the null because we claimed it would be positive and it came out negative. We claimed it would be positive, it came out negative. And this is that reminder that in SPSS, you can always convert a two-tailed p-value to a one-tailed p-value by dividing the p-value by two, just as we discussed. 0 0.005 divided by two would be 0 0.0025. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the coefficient of determination. This is the proportion of variance accounted for by the relationship and we call it R squared. If you have a perfect relationship, then it is one or 100%. If you have no relationship, then it's zero or 0%. Zero so all you have to do is take the R that you got and square it. That will tell you the percent or proportion of variance accounted for. Um, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a couple of issues that can come up with correlation. Now, the first one is called restricted range. Basically what it means is that if you don't choose your sample to be representative of your population, you may get a false finding for correlation. Let's look at this a little bit more. Let's look at the association between height and basketball ability. Height and basketball ability. So if we did the right thing and looked at this relationship in, in the whole population, because that's what I just said I'm interested in. I didn't say I'm interested in anything special, just height and basketball ability in people, right? Maybe in adults. So, um, Let's look at the whole population of adults and we see this nice positive relationship. Now let's say I did something silly. Let's say I happen to have access to a bunch of NBA basketball players. And I only look at those players. I'm only gonna look at these special players who are really have very strong basketball ability. And I ask each of them their height and I figure out their basketball ability. It looks like there's no relationship. It looks like there's no relationship. Why is that? Well, maybe, and I'm just conjecturing here, maybe in the NBA, once you get to that high level of ability, it doesn't really matter how tall you are. But in the main population, it does matter. Okay. Now, let's take another example. This time we're gonna look at swimming ability. And we're gonna look at the um, amount of, uh, you know how, how really good swimmers tend to uh, shave all their hair to kind of get that extra little bit of, you know, that extra millisecond. Yeah. So we're going to look at amount of, of shaved hair. Okay. Well, if we looked at everybody, which is what we should do, we see there's actually no association. So don't bother shaving all your body hair because it's not going to impact how fast you can swim or it's, they're not related. I should say, I shouldn't say impact. They're not related. Now let's look at Olympic gold medalists. Well, amongst the Olympic gold swim medalists, it looks like, wow, it did make a difference. Shaving that little extra bit of hair really did make a difference for them. 
Why? Well, in this case, maybe because every little thing um, will get you that extra little millisecond that you need. Whereas it's not important in the main population, it might be important in this population. Okay, so what am I saying at the end of the day? I'm saying if you choose a specialty population to look at, like the NBA players, like the Olympic gold swimming medalists, you may either miss a correlation that's really there, miss a relationship that's really there, or see a relationship that's really not there. So let me, that's important. So let me say that one more time. If you mismatch your sample and your population, you may have this restricted range problem where you miss a relationship that's there or see a relationship that's not there. One more big issue that can come up with correlation and that's outliers. Okay, so let's look at this. Here is five data points, A, B, C, D, E, five people, right? Here's their data. What's that R? That R is negative 0.08. Wow, very close to zero. This looks like a blob to me. There's not much going on here. Now, let's just add one more person. Here's person F, 14, 12. 14 over, 12 up. Now, suddenly, if I look at the correlation again, it goes from point, negative 0.08 to positive 0.85. What's going on here? What's going on is this person is a huge outlier, and they're unduly affecting this relationship. They're having way too much of an influence on this relationship. So it looks like there's a relationship when there isn't one. And outliers can do the opposite too. They can also make it look like there is not a relationship when there is one. Okay. So an outlier can unduly influence whether or not you believe you have a relationship. Okay. So Pearson correlation coefficient. I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. Okay. Please now go to D2L. Go to quizzes, go to quiz 10. The password is 1746 and answer one multiple choice question for this quiz. Okay. And that is all I have for you for this time. Please stay safe, be well, and I'll talk to you again soon.